everyone. My name is Barbara Bozic. So excited you could join us today for another UVA Club of Charlottesville Zoom event. Our club is one of over 100 clubs nationally and internationally. We exist, exist under the direction of the Office of Engagement to bring programming to alumni, parents, fans, friends in our community. We offer a variety of social athletic service, book club, and everyone is welcome to our club events. In addition, we've established a $500 annual scholarship, which we offer to a local student every year, um, a student entering first year at UVA. This year, due to your generosity, we were able to give away two, and we're very grateful for that. The scholarship information is on our website if you wish to support it in any way, and please join us at events or as volunteers anytime you like. Everyone is welcome. Tonight, we're so happy to host a discussion with Professor Adam Tashman regarding data science and how it is shaping our lives personally and professionally, the impact it has on academia and how the School of uh, UVA data science is different than others. Professor Tashman holds a PhD in applied mathematics and statistics from Stony Brook University, an MA in mathematics from Columbia University, and a BA in mathematics from UVA. I guess uh, Professor Tashman loves mathematics. He is the director of the online MS in data science program at UVA and currently teaches courses at the School of Data Science. If you have any questions uh, as you are listening to our conversation, please type them in and I will ask them in order or towards the end uh, when we have more Q&A. Professor Tashman, welcome. We cannot wait to hear your presentation and to have you answer all our questions. Inquiring minds want to know, tell us about data science. How is it shaping our lives personally and professionally? Sure, well, <clears throat> thank you very much for having me. Uh, thank you for attending this event. This is very exciting. I see some people I know. I see some, some of my students in the audience. So um, yeah, I, I get the question a lot of what is data science? And just as, as a quick, uh, th this was kind of interesting. I, I have a cousin that lives in the area. I had not seen him for a very long time. His father is actually a UVA professor. Um, and he asked me, what is data science? And I, I started to tell him, well, it's kind of a mix of mathematics, statistics, computing, and business knowledge. Um, and, and solving problems is very much at the forefront. And he goes, oh, so I guess my mom would qualify as a data scientist uh, because uh, she <clears throat> worked in computing at Columbia and MIT, uh, solving um, computational linguistics problems. And then she went to uh, the Pentagon and, and did some work there that he couldn't talk about. And, um, but it involved computers and math and statistics and all of this. So, so what you might even learn is maybe you're a data scientist and you didn't realize it by this definition, or maybe you know people who are data scientists. And I, I found um, for the work that I was doing, uh, I, I, I always loved math, you could tell from my education, and I, I particularly did applied math. And um, when I would go into industry and, and want to get jobs, I'd have to be able to program things because you generally had to do that to solve problems. And so I was this, and, and I worked on Wall Street and, uh, when I started. And so it was this mix of learn whatever tools necessary. To, to solve problems. It, it, people didn't care if it was, you know, the, the cutting edge thing or not. Sometimes it was, but it was really about that the solving the problems was at the forefront. And I kind of spanned boundaries. And, and when I, and even when I published papers, some of them were, were in statistics or some of them were, were in uh, quant finance. And it's like, in some ways, I felt like I didn't have a home. Like I was this weird hybrid creature with, you know, four arms. And then data science came along. And at first I was like, isn't this just like a rebrand of statistics? And I think a lot of people felt that way because you're like, what is statistics? It's like getting a bunch of data and building models and making predictions and solving problems. And, and you do things like sampling and hypothesis testing and all of this. So there was that question of like, is this not just a rebranding of, of statistics? And then as people started to study it more, they realized, well, Statistics usually concerns itself with the quantitative, with numbers. And these days we get things in all forms of data and, and quite quickly, right? So we have things like the internet and sensors and cloud computing, some of its numbers, but some of its text, some of its video, some of its images, you get the CAT scans or, or ECG waves or um, you know, newspaper articles or people's purchases on a website. So the scope of the data and the amount of data 
really was outside what st statisticians typically worked with. And it, to do that sort of work, you actually needed a lot more computational prowess that actually overlapped pretty well with what computer scientists do. The computer scientists could process a lot of this data in its different forms, but they didn't always know maybe the predictive modeling or some of the mathematics and statistics involved. So there was this thing where it's kind of like, you know, you need a, you need a blend of these things. And, and, and as people thought about statistics, it kind of seemed like statistics is maybe a portion of that whole pipeline. Like the beginning of the pipeline is collect a whole bunch of data, right? And the end of the pipeline is like presented to stakeholders. And then in the middle is like form hypotheses and build models. So some people would, would say that statistics is, is a piece of it. Data science might be broader than all of that. Um, so then, you know, these jobs started to come about, these data science jobs. And a lot of people would rebrand themselves as data scientists. They would learn some more things. So these people might be computer scientists or statisticians. Me, with a applied math background, there were a lot of things I had to learn. Um, also, also how to work with different sorts of data and become, frankly, become a better programmer and, and test data and, and software and things like this. Um, so, Universities started to take notice that this data science is not going away. They would hear about things like big data and, and they could tell it was broader than statistics. And what started to happen was different departments would wanna own it. And I've, I've seen it at different places. So I, I was um, actually faculty at UC Santa Barbara. That's my, that picture that I've got in the background actually is out in Santa Barbara. Um, I was with the statistics and applied probability department. They kind of wanted to own data science. And they and I built, um, I'd say the first class for them, it was uh, big data computing. Then they started building more classes when computer science department was like, hey, hold on a second here. We think we should own this. And then environmental science was like, well, we're doing a lot of these techniques too. And we think we should own this. And there became this kind of gridlock where, and then other departments as well started piling in. So they formed like an institute. And this is what a lot of universities did. Um, some of them raised money. So there's one at UC San Diego called the Halika Glue Institute. Um, Halika Glue is one of the early founders of Facebook. Um, and it was an institute which meant different professors were collaborating together, uh, doing research, building, teaching classes. It wasn't really a centralized place. And frankly, sometimes it caused a lot of friction because again, there was no mandate of who owns this. Um, so I was kind of, you know, working with that department, talking to computer science department. Um, turned out, you know, UVA also had a data science institute started, you may know this, started by Don Brown many years ago. Don Brown's uh, you know, background as in systems engineering. So the data science institute, the DSI at UVA, um, was pulling people from engineering, computer science, statistics, and even other places, like when you think about ethics, you need law, or when you think about some of the business applications, you need the comm school or Darden. Um, one of the things that, that was really fortuitous was about two and a half years ago, the Quantitative Foundation, based here in Charlottesville, gave the largest grant ever to UVA, $130 million, to start a new school of data science, the 12th school at UVA. For me, this was really appealing because I'd seen kind of the downside to not having it centralized, not having a mandate. And so, wow, this is really interesting because now they'll be able to hire faculty specifically for this school and, and the people could concentrate on this and not worry about like existential questions like, is this other department gonna wipe me out or something? It's really hard to do your job when you're worried about the status of your job. But when you're not and you feel like nurtured, you could thrive, right? Um, so two and a half years ago, the, the School of Data Science was born. Um, it was kind of people that were in these different uh, departments. Some of them were coming over full-time. We still have some people that kind of are cross-listed. Um, when I heard about the School of Data Science, I was really excited. Uh, I, I actually came back to, um, a few years ago from my reunion, I heard Jim Ryan talk about the new school, immediately reached out. The guy I reached out to was Phil Bourne. He ended up becoming our dean. Um, when I reached out to Phil, he said, what do you want to do for us? And I said, well, I built this course at UC Santa Barbara. I think maybe I could, you know, add things to it and develop it and teach it for UVA. So that's how I got involved. I, I was teaching that class online because I was in California. So I was kind of pandemic ready before the pandemic because I was teaching an online class, right? So, um, 
so that's that's just a little bit about how, how the school started. I think we have something like like forty people in it now. We have ambitions to really grow it. We have um, you, you know you've probably seen the uh, we broke ground a couple, few weeks ago on the new building. Uh, the thought is that that might be completed in about three years, and um, we're you know aggressively hiring staff, faculty. We're aggressively building programs. So the academic program that started was the master's program. Usually, you kind of need things that help bootstrap the fi the finances to get the thing off the ground. So we started with the you know the residential master's program. Then the second was the online master's program. Uh, we also have an undergraduate minor. So those are all the things that are you know formally in place. Plans have to go through Chev. It takes it takes some time. Um, planning to launch the PhD program next fall. And then finally the undergraduate major, probably in about two years, that, that's the, the current thinking. So, you know, a master's program, both online residential, uh, undergraduate minor with PhD and the uh, under, undergraduate major to follow. We also have a pretty interesting dual degree programs. Um, so we have, people that are doing DART and MBA with a master's in data science. So these things are pretty rigorous. In the same time frame you'd get an MBA at Darden, you're also now getting a master's in data science. Uh, we've joined programs with some of the other uh, places too, like with the uh, medical school. So we've had a few students who are both becoming doctors and are thinking already that they want to apply uh, data science to do clinical research. Also, also, some people doing uh, you know, PhD in medicine and um, masters in data science. Um, these different programs serve different needs. So I, I direct the online master's program. Uh, how is that different from the residential? So on, online, well, it's generally students who are people who are older, sometimes mid-career, people who are maybe engineers, who, who, um, who are developers that want to get into data science. A lot of our residential master students are are entering right after college. In some ways, it's a little easier because they have things like calculus fresh in their mind. Uh, so that's just a kind of a little bit of background about the school and program. I could probably fill the whole hour just talking about that. So so I'll I'll move on to some of these other things. How, how is data science shaping our lives personally and professionally? Um, you know, it was it was kind of around for many decades, but like in the background, and you might not have noticed unless you did certain things like uh, you know, national security, defense, uh, finance, where there's massive data sets around astronomy, physics, certain types of engineering, so certain types of sciences. So these things were all going on, but they were kind of in a very specific areas, like like Wall Street, and they were building these you know models and working with massive amounts of data for quite a while. Um, things started to change when you had some of these tech companies coming around like Amazon and Google, um, you know, so doing things like archiving massive amounts of data and making them very searchable. UVA was one of the first schools that took the library and put it online and made it searchable. And when you do this, you have all sorts of problems you need to solve. So there's a lot of buzzwords in data science, but some of the ideas are actually pretty simple. You have massive amounts of things and how do you store it all? And then when it's stored, how do you make it easily retrievable? How do you make it understandable? When you're, when you're building a model and you have millions of things you could use to predict something, how do you decide what you should use to predict something? What's the best method for that? What's the best method of you know, digesting data when you, and, and summarizing it when you couldn't even look at all of it? Um, so a lot of times the answer is do things with statistics, do things with computing, make visualizations, that make it easier for us as humans to process that much data. Um, Amazon, you know, so started selling books, but became this, well, two things really, an e-commerce juggernaut that was selling everything and also a cloud computing company that, that, that really drives most of the profit, right? So they weren't, if you were on that stock, you weren't making money on it really for a long time. And we were told to be patient. And then came along their cloud computing business. They were using that for, for to solve their e-commerce problem, store all this stuff. A novel thing that we interface with all the time now is when users are consuming products like books or other things, uh, in consumer goods with Amazon, movies on Netflix or Disney or music and Spotify, it's captured what we're using, what, what we're buying, what we're interacting with and what we like. And 
they would like to recommend similar things. Like, you know, when you buy some tequila, they'll put the salt next to it. Same kind of thing with Amazon, right? So you buy this and they say, you might also like that. There, there are brick and mortar companies now that want to compete with Amazon so they don't get demolished. You've seen, particularly with COVID, some of the retail, right? Even, even lofty retail like Nordstrom, struggling, closing stores, Saks, you know, uh, Neiman Marcus. Some of them are trying to evolve now and building global marketplaces the same way. So Walmart did it, Target did it. Now, if you look in the news, Bed Bath wants to do it. Macy's wants to do it. So that Macy's is a new CEO. And they want to focus on their e-commerce build, uh, business. And what they're doing, they actually want to create a platform where anybody can reach out to Macy's and say, hey, Macy's, I, I want you to sell this for me through your platform. Macy's announced this recently. Their stock price went up 22% today. People are starting to believe that maybe Macy's and these other places won't go out of business. Maybe they'll be able to compete doing the same thing. Electronic marketplaces, enabling easy access to goods, making it searchable, recommending things that are very relevant. So all these things are data science problems that have to be solved, right? So um, out building algorithms. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the dark side of it. You might've seen it with things like social network. When they start to do this and they start to capture this data from us, well, it, it could make things very convenient and easy for us, but it could also be manipulated. Um, financial markets. So I, I worked in um, a department that did fair lending. Actually, it was broader. It, mo it validated models. So after 2008, when the market imploded and we had the, the Great Recession, banks were told by regulators, if you're a bank that's you know, too, too big that, that could present a systemic risk, they had to have an internal group that validated the models. A lot of banks, especially the big ones, are basically tech companies that wield large amounts of capital. Um, and what I started to learn was banks have hundreds of models or more. Every single decision, um, there's a model to decide, should you get a mortgage? There's a model to decide if you should get a mortgage, what interest rate should you get for that mortgage? Um, this makes it so that very scalable so they can process massive amounts of mortgage. It used to be that they would you know, talk to the customers, but now for many of the products, it's fully automated. Auto loan, fully automated, you can do it on the web. Mortgage, becoming more and more automated. It's quick, it's convenient, but what are those predictors in the models, right? Um, so something like finance, if you're trying to get capital, the only thing according to regulators and good practice, the only thing that should decide if you get capital is your ability and willingness to pay. That's it, shouldn't matter anything about your demographics, your age, your gender, your religion, none of this should matter. But sometimes those things are predictors in models. Usually people don't just put in gender, but literally I saw one bank get sued because one of their predictors was if someone pressed two to hear a, a, the message in Spanish on the phone, or what's your occupation? And you think big deal, what's your occupation? Well, then you start to, I would, you know, as a model validator, I drill into what are these sorts of occupations and I'd find nurses and would you know, most nurses are female. It was acting like a proxy for females. Um, and that's unfair, right? And so, so as model validators, we would have to lean on that and say, yeah, you can't use these predictors. Um, it was you know, really just something that they, the developer didn't even realize. And, and that's the thing is a lot of times it's not, that, it's not that somebody is meaningfully trying to bias or meaningfully trying to harm. It's just that it's humans building these things, right? And ultimately, even if computers build them, they were probably programmed by humans. So that, that's kind of, we have to be careful with that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, you, you'll, you'll now see nearly everything. The last example I'll give of how it's um, personally and professionally manifesting. So we see it in all these areas, right? So, so I talked about retail. And with retail as buyers of goods, we, this comes up all the time. Um, another one, if you've been following Facebook, I'm sorry, now they're meta, or uh, NVIDIA is that they're building something, Meta calls it the um, metaverse and NVIDIA calls it the omniverse. And it's really interesting. So, so listening to Jensen Huang, the, the CEO of NVIDIA, I would encourage you to take a look at it. It's, it's like a 20 minute video. You can find it on, on um, Yahoo Finance. He talks about the omniverse and, and, and the idea is this, use um, 
you use the augmented reality where you, they will they want to build take physical objects and make a digital twin of them in other words there's only so many physical things in the world you're kind of limited right and and, um, and it's hard to test them and it, it could be resource intensive but you could create them in an augmented reality so for example a forest and if a fire starts what's the likely path through the fire or an automobile and have it in this augmented reality so that you can in inspect it in this augmented reality and test it and evaluate it or build GPU chips or something, which is you know one of their main businesses. But, the, but their ambition is to build these kind of things because you can have, you know, infinite number, infinite copies of an object in the augmented reality. You can even have robots in the augmented reality that get trained. And it's much faster to train these things in the augmented reality. So you imagine you have thousands, tens of thousands of robots each getting trained. And the ones that get really good, they actually get built. The robots that are good get built. The cars that are good get built. It's kind of wild stuff. I, I found it really interesting. But, but this is why Facebook stock went crazy. This is why NVIDIA stock has been going crazy. They're selling the idea of the omniverse and that and all the stuff that could be enabled um nvidia makes graphical processing units so those gpus are what power all the the deep learning all the ai that's going on hence why their, their stock is, is taken off they started um making these graphics cards for video games that's how they started that was their bread and butter and then they started to realize that the calculations of video games are, are a lot of very simple but but massive calculations um video games you need to like move things around you need to do very many quick uh calculations just like in machine learning and deep learning it's basically it looks it's a, they're complex models but they're built up of very simple things additions and multiplications in, in various orders um the next one was how can we become more data literate and why is that important to a normal person or a person working in a you know, medium company. I, I want to talk about big companies and government later, if you can, please, because a lot of people might be looking at it from a the point of view of their more limited capacity at work and why data science is important to them. Sure. Yeah. So when I started in finance, a lot of it, the ambitions and and the need for tech was 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 great, but some of the things they were doing were were like in Excel spreadsheets. And um, now that may even be beyond what some people do, but um, you know, Excel spreadsheets are nice because you can kind of see everything, right? You see all the numbers. People still like them to look at the reporting. Um, so I think one place to start, well, the first thing is probably psychological, like try to eradicate fear, relax fears of math and computing. Uh, I think a lot of people are afraid of these things. Um, even for me, I mean, I didn't take much computing in college, but I just learned that I had to learn it for my job. So sometimes when you have to learn something for your job, you find a way to learn it. Um, and I'd say more, more broadly, I, I really love, what I love about data science is it, in, in some ways, it, it doesn't focus on the math. It, it comprises the math, but it doesn't focus on it. I think that's nice. Um, but one area is, as I, I kind of I like to make a lot of decisions based on data and and even think about things in terms of data and and so so you could start small with just that process of you know when people when you read something in the media start to ask like well what are the assumptions here how are they tricking me what how is this biased you see it all the time with um, you know nutrition um, and and starting to and and even you know if if you kind of look at what are the different sources of bias, like survivorship bias. Yeah. Um, you'll start to see them all over the place. And, and it makes you just more aware of what's going on. And I, I think another thing is, is starting to just start small with maybe you capture some of your own data, if it's like in your workouts, um, and, and start to make decisions with it, form, hypothes form hypotheses, you know. And um, getting into that habit, it, I think it's a good habit to get into because, you know, humans in general have have this bias. There's a good book called Thinking Fast and Slow by uh, Kahneman. And he would say, <laughs> okay, thumbs up. And so, so 
you know, his, his whole career was, was studying things like you know, decision making and and um, and also the fact that, that humans are constantly biased and they don't even realize. Uh, so I think be, being kind of aware of that, realizing, you know, I, I would ask people at work like, hey, did you did you look over these these numbers and what do you think? And, they, and they'd be like, yeah, it seemed like usually the, the values were greater than 10. And that's the, the kind of answer I'd get from people that, you know, sometimes greater than 10. And then we'd go back and look at it and I said, are you sure? And we'd look at it and it actually wasn't the case at all. And I said, so how about you actually calculate like an average or a median or, you know, distribution or something. And you, and you start to realize that awareness of like your intuition fools you. And it's not just, I'm not just talking to people here, but it's true with me too. And I've been doing it, you know, my, my career has been, all this uh, stuff based on data, but it happens to all of us. There are all sorts of bias. Maybe you just remember the things you saw most recently. Maybe you saw the things that were just more appealing or interesting to you. Maybe you just focus on the things that you agree with. It happens in politics all the time. Like they might say, I won't get into politics here, but you wonder sometimes, how does this person not believe this when there's all this data out there to the contrary? And you realize that People are very selective with what they process. They process things that support their conclusions. It happens in finance too. You own some stock, you're really excited about it. Any article that you read that's in support of that is something you remember, something you make face your decisions on. The articles that say that this thing could sell off 50%, it could tank. Maybe you just try to forget about it. But I would encourage you read that article, ask if, those, if, if the points that the author's making are sound or if those are biased. So, so I think, it, it, it's a it's a habit and and it's kind of um, you know like learning an instrument or eating right or something like that at, at first, and I would say so so kind of getting in that mindset of you 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 know you can get started in it you start to you know maybe take down some some data you you save it in different places maybe at first it's Excel and if, if you get the urge you could start to learn programming languages like Python. Which um, some of these Python, some of these programming languages these days are much easier to learn. I feel because they're much higher level, uh, and there's a lot of things you don't have to think about. So, so if, if you've done something like C++, that's much gorier detail than like Python. So, and, and fortunately, the programming languages that people use in data science are mostly Python and R, which are nice and easier to use, more accessible for for more people, and I think excellent for our students to get started as well. So. That, that's really great that you um, ended that with the talking about Python, because one of the questions the students had asked me to ask you was, what do you feel that future students will need to be to have in their bag of tricks in order to uh, do better in the School of Data Science and feel more comfortable with the information and the process if they're not coming from a mathematical or a computer background? And you just answered that part of that question. Maybe you want to talk more to it on what kind of student is attracted to it. And uh, if there are parents sitting here listening and they are thinking of maybe considering this with their kids, what, what do you think is something they need to prepare for instead of waiting until the last minute, you know, learn Python the week before you start data science, so to speak? Sure, yeah, it's, it's a good question. And um, so I work very closely with admissions for School of Data Science. Um, and, and then um, for the online master's program, um, you know, you know we, we look over the applicants and um, make the admit decisions. So we, we, we did one semester where we um, tried to be extremely inclusive, have very few requirements, very stripped down, didn't really require much programming at all, and found that for a master's program, which is basically a year, that, that's, that's a hard lift for people. So particularly if you've in the online program where maybe you're mid-career and it's been, you know, 20 years since you've done calculus or programming, that, that could be very hard. Um, so what we settled on were four prereqs. So one of them was that you've taken calculus, the first one, um, that you've taken a statistics course, that you've um, taken linear algebra, and that you've taken some programming course. And so we don't require what the programming language is, but you know, programming is something you need to get used to. It's, it's pretty conceptual and it could take some time to absorb. 
What if you don't have all four of those things? Um, you can take them at a community college. You could, um, we're starting to build some of these things at UVA. There's a linear algebra prereq course that you could take with us. We want to build some of the other ones too in-house. But so we have a lot of applicants who, um, you know, maybe don't meet all the requirements and, and they, they talk with us in admissions, very friendly admissions team. And um, they, would, they would point out like, here's what you could do to fill those requirements. Um, I think I think it's very helpful because then it, and then it kind of gets gives people the foundation, um, and then when students come into the program, there's a um, you know one of the early courses that they take is is uh, programming uh, for data science. So it's it's a course that I redeveloped in the uh, in the spring, and that's really to get everybody like on the same footing, so that they feel comfortable, and then and then it kind of builds from there. But I will say not everyone is STEM. I mean, uh, you know, science, tech, engineering, or math. Uh, we intentionally want to have a broad net, but at the same time, we have to have some prereqs. So, but we have people that come in from all sorts of different backgrounds. So humanities, um, people that come in from business, people that, that um, really all different areas. So, so and, and they do well. And, um, and they have all sorts of different interests. So, so some of them want to do things in sports, like sports analytics. Some of them want to do things in healthcare. Some of them want to. We had we had one person that came in that worked uh, in Hollywood, and she wanted to do things with, like with detecting, like almost like making like the, the highlight reel from a movie um, or the trailers. I, I guess so th that was one project she was working on. How to how to summarize a movie with a certain uh, short amount of footage or like still images. Um, and then making the decision of which program is right for you. What do you want to do? So, you know, there, there are these master's programs and, and next year we'll be launching a PhD program. Um, I would say, you know, if, if you want to work as a practitioner in industry with a master's degree, you know, so there are, many, there are many companies that require a graduate degree, um, particularly the big tech companies. Smaller ones like startups uh, can be happy with a bachelor's degree. But, um, but, but there's some companies that, you know, that require masters and there are some that require a PhD. So I was talking to some a few weeks ago, they work at Morgan Stanley. They got in with a master's degree, but it sounds like these days, most of the people, most of the time they require a PhD. So. Excellent, thank you about that. Um, we had two questions that kind of go together. So I'll see if I can summarize them uh, and kind of tie them in. One is there, are there any instances where you feel that the growth of data science as a field is outpacing researchers and companies' ability to implement it properly? And it ties in with the question about um, how, when is it useful? What are the limitations and overuse? And that's what we were talking about before regarding the company Zillow, where they overused or ever overextended. So maybe we can you can tie that in together with us about the growth, how companies are outpacing, uh, they, it's outpacing companies' abilities and how they're using it wrong and making sometimes wrong decisions because they think they understand data science. Yeah, so in terms of instances where the growth of field is outpacing researchers, I definitely see it. And, and, it's, and it's not limited to just data science. It, it happens even so, um, for example, my advisor um, worked at a hedge fund for, for a long time and then went to, to academia. And he would go to academia and, and say, you know, the things that academia was published were things that Renaissance technologies had used maybe 10 years ago or something like this. Um, and it happens in data science too. And, and one of the reasons it happens is that some of the biggest tech companies have the data locked up. Google, Facebook, Amazon, they may not share this data, right? And so, Many of the tools originated because these companies needed to solve their own problems. So big data, those early tools were developed at Yahoo. They had a really successful research division and they built things like, like they hired someone to, to develop what became Hadoop. Um, there, and then there were places where also in academia where, there, where some of these tools were being built. So Berkeley was built, ended up building Spark. And so some of these some of these places, like particularly in academia, they try to open source them. So Spark was given to Apache. Apache Software Foundation uh, open sources all the tools. So it's a really great place. And um, 
Apache is just comprised of people that volunteer their time to help build tools. But 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 many of these tools kind of first lived inside you know big companies, and and then after a little while when they feel kind of comfortable that you know they built some moat they might open source them. So there is that lag where you know software at first is like in the companies and the data sets are in the companies. But after a while, I mean, it's like those few companies can't do everything, right? And, and they start to, and, and we start to forge partnerships and universities do this. And, um, you know, so UVA as well, the, the companies get back and they share. And the companies also, they only have so many people, they can't solve all their problems. So you'll see a lot of times that they partner. Um, so so I, I don't know, for me, I don't see it as being like a, a huge problem that uh, industry is outpacing it, but it, but it's it would be a, a huge problem if if academics and, and others outside of that ecosystem weren't actively trying to stay relevant and contribute. And I would say also, data science as a whole is is evolving very quickly, so that data science as a field could like outpace everyone. <laughs> so, um, it, in other words, it could outpace the. Uh, the demand for it could outpace the supply of, of students that we have for it. And I want to talk about this a little bit because it's, I see data science as a way to, to really provide upward mobility to the next generation and the future generations. It's not going away. Um, so, and, and what's nice is, you know, I mean, Math did this in some ways, right? So there were some things you could do with something like math. You could go to Wall Street and, you know, people would do that and they'd say, hey, I can make a good living doing this. Or science, you know, there are certain fields where you would learn these bodies of knowledge, medicine and law, where you could go and have a good life. But um, you had to go through many years of specialized school and, and you, you know, it, it's extremely competitive and, and pretty limited as far as um, supply of jobs. But data science is something every company now you know, you see it, it, not just Amazon, but now Macy's and, and Walmart and McDonald's. And I mean, Kurt Vonnegut used to joke that one day you'll need two PhDs to work at McDonald's. He wrote this in the 60s, I think. And now it's kind of true to be a data scientist at McDonald's. You, well, maybe you need one PhD, not two, but, but there's all sorts of places you can work now when you get a degree in data science. And I think that's really exciting because it means that our students could, could you know study data science and, and go help all these different companies and in some sense you say it's really audacious why do we think people could get out of college and just be able to help turn around a company or answer questions that they've been grappling with for decades or something it seems almost a paradox right but startups do it all the time i went to one called Carpe Data, where we would we learned that it, within a few years, we could detect fraud better than insurance companies that have been trying to do it for 100 years. Or fintech companies could trade markets better than Charles Schwab or something. So they get bought by Charles Schwab. Uh, so yeah, I, I, could, I could really see it as something where it provides upward mobility. Um, we need to try to get a lot of engagement and uh, really, and provide that education for people, uh, which kind of gets back to again one of the reasons that I, you know, I came to UVA. I really wanted to focus, you know, in, in two areas, and and that was as I did a lot in finance and, and felt like I wanted to try other things. It was really uh, education and healthcare. So a lot of the research I do is in healthcare, and um, the other really cool thing is. Um, not just in higher ed, but also in K through 12, now states are revising the curricula. So in the state of Virginia, every seven years, they revise the curriculum. And I don't know if you've noticed from what you did in math in say high school or what your kids or grandkids do in math, but math is taught as if computers did not exist. And, and they're solving problems as if they're trying to compete with Soviet Russia. Like you're doing a lot with trigonometry and geometry and not, you know, not much with things like more like applied math. And so that's changing. So the, the, the Department of Education in Virginia is, is working to revamp their curriculum. Next year in the fall, they'll roll out Data Science One to high school students, um, to, to a sample of high schools. The following fall, 2023, they'll be offering Data Science to all high school students. Can students still take calculus? Yeah, but it's gonna be a menu of things now that students could choose from. Um, 
they, they, they also engaged with UVA School of Data Science to ask us to advise on, on some of this. They asked me, so I'm involved now, helping to build a financial mathematics class that will be taught in the high schools. So that will be in starting fall 2023 because we could cast a wider net, right? So what they were finding in Virginia is that increasingly students did not want to take math in 12th grade. They were trying to place out of it. Now they take personal finance, they take economics, but a lot of times they want to do other things. And that's because we're just not showing everything that, that it could do, right? I mean, when I took calculus, it's like, where did this function come from? I don't know. Or like, would I need this if I wasn't like an engineer or a physicist or mathematician? And the answer is, yeah, like now this stuff gets used everywhere uh, in data science. So let's like, but we have to start as early as we can. So we, we can, in, in some way, even teach data science principles to kindergartners. Um, so so th there's, a, there's a good, th Jerome Bruner was a, well, an educator and professor who used to say, you can teach anyone anything in an honest way at some level. Right, so I have a, a daughter, she's five, she's in kindergarten. And there are things I can teach her about data science. So, so she was eating Starburst. She had those little packs with the two Starbursts in a pack from Halloween candy. And I said, what are all the different arrangements you could make of the Starburst candies? And she could put them together, you know, and that introduces ideas like combinatorics and probability. Maybe she organizes them in some way. And now it looks like a matrix or something or a multiplication table or something like that. So that's, that's kind of my evil plot is that I would like to take data science back all the way to kindergarten in some way. Because another problem I was seeing was when I was hiring people on my data science teams, the candidates were not diverse at all. It was pretty sad. And it's not gonna happen overnight that we're just gonna have this really diverse pool. And why do I care about diversity? I care about diversity because it shouldn't be that your life will be substandard just because of like how you were born or what family you were born into. You should, right? So there was a good quote I saw. It said, um, talent is uniformly distributed, but opportunity is not. Um, but it could be, right? And, and it's hard and there are politics and it takes time and all of this, but I feel like the answer is data science is this great vehicle for upward mobility. So work it all the way back to kindergarten and start teaching it to everybody. And nobody should be afraid of data science. Like they're like some people are afraid of math, right? And really start to absorb and, and use data to, to make better decisions because we know we know that humans are, you know, they have these biases and these limitations. There's only so much we can do. And that may be depressing, but it's also liberating because I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like I should be able to do anything in my head. And it's like this giant burden. Like if someone's like, hey, multiply these numbers together, then I should be able to be quick at doing it. Or, or hey, did, will these things all fit in this briefcase or something? And like, I should be able to do it. But when you start to say, I don't have to have all these answers because I'm human. It's almost liberating, but here's the thing. We, I am also not saying that we should be defeatist and say, we can't do these things. What I'm saying is understand your awareness so you can delegate it to other people and also delegate it to machines and computers, robots that could be better in some ways than us, right? So if we understand what we can and can't do, we could try to build better entities that could help us, that can be better in some of those areas so that we can team with them. So I love that too. I, lo I love being at UVA and being able to partner with people. And we, we have some excellent people in the School of Data Science and, and, and we have so much to do. Seriously, like no two days are the same. And it's one of the first places where I'm like, I can't just get it all done the way I want to, but you know, but but teaming with other people and finding where their, their strengths are. Anyway, I'm rambling so I'll you are not and that was really really interesting about what uh, you were saying regarding teaching the concepts of data science to young kids and introducing them to concepts of how to sort and how to look at um, things in their daily tasks in a mathematical way which is really interesting and uh, and very good um, i was speaking uh, a 
couple of years ago, I was speaking to a professor of uh, math in uh, another university overseas. And she, I thought she was a little bit, she exaggerated when she said that um, people who don't understand or know how to use or know how data science is, is used in the future in their jobs will be somewhat illiterate. And I just thought that that was such a, um, I don't know, an extreme comment. And yeah. what I'm learning about, um, you know, what data science is and how early you need to start and now you validated that I, she might have been correct <laughs> that in the future it would be like knowing how to read at a certain grade level in order for you to be able to do your job better and administer other people and supervise them and know what, what information you're looking for. Um, what um, a lot of people were asking, and that was something that I guess we can kind of, um, we can close with like a different question, but data ethics. A lot of people are wondering what is our responsibility in using data, um, using data science to do things more ethical and companies using them and government using it to be more ethical and us personally using it to be more ethical. It's a pretty broad question, but maybe, you know, I'm sure you guys discuss that all the time and maybe you can help us with that. Yeah, you know, anytime that there is a good idea, um, and a lot of these things start as good ideas to benefit mankind, and then there are always bad actors, right? So whether it was credit derivatives that were developed for, to transfer risk properly, or whether it was nuclear power, um, you know, so with, with all of these things, and now, and now with things like the algorithm and data science, um, you know, they generally start with, with good ideas in mind. And then you have these, sometimes it's bad actors or sometimes it's just, just something that's just lurks beneath the surface. Like I was talking about with the putting occupation into a, a model. Um, or even when you're open sourcing data, you know, is, is that okay? And what, what data should be open source? So it's, it's really like, or, or Facebook started out as, you know, something to bring people together. And then actually it became quite divisive in, in some instances, right? Um, and what can you do about that? Can it be completely solved? Well, I mean, so the responsibility, my, my answer is like, like financial markets needed to be regulated. Right. And, and so you had like the Dodd-Frank Act and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, CFPB, that mandated that banks, if, if they were too big to fail, they, they had to have in, internal groups that basically protected the bank from itself and protected the bank from everyone outside of the bank. And I always felt like this needed to happen with social media companies, that, that there needed to be kind of third party, you know, or internal groups that, that are independent, validating these things systematically. I mean, so we had to be very intentional when we were validating banks of what things to look for, what predictors, how is the data collected? How is it being used? What's the use of the, this model and what are the limitations of that model? Because otherwise companies, they try to satisfy their shareholders. And that means you know, doing what it takes. They're not gonna cut their arm off. They're not gonna put themselves out of business, nor should they really. And there's only so much that they could do. Now, one thing is uh, you might argue that it'll get out of hand, you know, that, that how could they even regulate themselves and Facebook's trying and they're failing. Well, then the answer is that if you can't regulate yourself properly, you shouldn't be in that business. That would be my answer. So, you know, exotic derivatives were, were you know, built, um, you know, on Wall Street. And, and when those got out of hand, they, they, the market for them went away and they stopped trading and then they, they went back to the more basic ones. Um, but they, but it, you know, so I feel like that, that does need to be regulated. Um, and then there needs to be groups where they are, are given the mandate to do that. And I'll say like, as, as the um, algorithms got more complex, the people at the regulatory agency started having PhDs and started being highly trained. And so, you know, at first it was a joke, like, oh, the Wall Street quants could just like steamroll the quants in, uh, that are regulators. And then it became not the case at all. Um, I've seen some very good regulators. So that, a lot of people may not be aware of that, that that, that was going on at banks, but but it has been at banks that they have these model validation. And those those groups actually are, are the lar probably the largest fraction of quants on Wall Street, the model validators. and it makes me sleep better at night. I'm glad I learned it. And frankly, doing that stuff made me a better model developer as well, because I started to think about 
um, what's going into them. And so, and then when I went into insurance, insurance is behind finance and healthcare sadly is behind insurance, which is amazing. It's amazing that, that they are more advanced and pushing capital around the world than they are at saving lives, but it's true. I worked in all those industries. Um, some of it might just be because, you know, money comes before these things or the, you know, uh, I, won't, I won't get into the cynical view of that, but um, so, so when I went to insurance, they weren't really, the regulators, I, I don't even think we're aware really of like what could go into these algorithms or how sophisticated, but me coming from model validator background, looked at it carefully and said, you know, I, I probably shouldn't even put like, like if I'm trying to predict what kind of restaurants go out of business, I probably shouldn't even put if it's a Mexican restaurant or a Thai restaurant, because that could be discriminating against the people that work there or the people that patronize those restaurants, right? So, and I certainly can't put in demographic variables. So I have to be very careful about them. Um, so, so, there, so there's that part of the ethics, like, you know, and, um, and the, and the other part of it, I think we're intentional at UVA and I think other schools, it would also be great if they're intentional about what they're training their students to do. Uh, so these programs, you know, we have a lot of data science and related programs in the country and others. And um, they typically include data ethics uh, where, you're, where you're learning about what's the proper use of, of collecting data, sharing it, using models. Um, so that students are aware, it shouldn't just be an afterthought. It, it's integrated into the process. While you're building the model, while you're deciding what goes into it, you should be thinking about, you know, am I introducing bias? Am I fooling somebody here? And it's, it's, it's actually, it's a large responsibility. And um, I mean, I, I saw someone fr from the CFA Institute, or James Landy, and I know that because I took a CFA exam, I know that ethics is a large portion of the CFA. It would also be really great if there's a chartered data science institute we, we might want to think about that in Charlottesville. Um, and, and a portion of it should be um, ethics, but, it, but it's highly important. So you need that, you need that counterbalance and you need students to always be, be thinking about that. So, so one other thing I should mention is also just understanding not just the ethics, but the limitations to what AI can do. With any tool, you start to think this tool will solve every problem, whether it was computers, the internet, electricity, magnetism, or algorithms or data science you have to start to understand what the boundaries are. And we don't know all the boundaries, which is why some data scientists get paid outrageous money compared to you know, other sorts of uh, fields that are, might be related because companies just, they don't know the boundaries or how far it could go. And Zillow is an interesting use case. Um, if you've got on Zillow, or, you know, if, if you know, their primary business of course is, um, you know, marketing properties for sale. And then they started producing a Z estimate, which is an algorithm built by data scientists at Zillow that estimates the value of your house, which seems kind of audacious because you'd say like, do they figure out things like, do I have dead patches on my lawn or does the house just look ugly or, you know, whatever. But, you know, I, I'm not sure what those predictors are, but frankly, they're not as good as they thought they were. Uh, they decided they got, they decided that they would get into the business of flipping houses. Um, and so using, so they really were believers in their data scientists and their algorithm. And they, and they at scale, were buying homes and they ran into a couple of problems. One was they couldn't even get enough people to like contractors to do the work to fix up these houses. And two, they bought at the top of the bubble, like when things went crazy and people decided it's a pandemic. I've always wanted to live in, you know, St. Pete's Beach or, you know, Santa Barbara or whatever. And now I'm just going to go live there. And prices went crazy and they bought at the top of the market. And they announced, uh, I think it was a few weeks ago, that that business is not working. I, I think they lost, they're going to lose something like 600 million and lay off 25% of their workforce. Um, so you start to see that it can't, it, you know, AI can't solve everything. It also tells us nothing beats a great broker. Um, a great broker that knows the market well because there are nuances, right? So, and, and I'll say this too, when I started to, I guess, formally get interested in data science, because before that I was doing applied math, I, I, I got onto um, the, the database to look at uh, real estate prices and, and was looking to sell my house. And so, you know, pulled a bunch of that data with my wife and we put in interesting predictors, like was this house built in the eighties or something? And, um, 
but we had to, we did it neighborhood by neighborhood to be very specific because we saw in our neighborhood, homes had at least an acre. So an acre was not a big deal to anybody that lived there, but a neighborhood over from us, an acre was a lot of property. People would pay more for an acre. Um, so it, it, sometimes it, it, it really matters what data you're training on and what your predictors are. And, but the, the, the upshot of that story was I went, I went to the broker. I, she said, you should list it at this price. And, and I said, well, my model says I can list it for a, a bit more. And she said, all right, let's go with the model. We ended up selling it for a bit more. And then she said, can I have your model? And I was like, <laughs> but, um, and I realized like, this is interesting. There's something to this. Like there's, there's some systematic things, but, but again, like I had the time to just specifically model two neighborhoods and spent many hours just on two neighborhoods in the US. So Zillow doing it at scale, that's a very hard problem. I'm not saying it can't be done, but how do you know when it's good enough? So, so we'll see now, like we know some companies that could really do this. Um, particularly with, with marketing and recommendation algorithms. These things work very well, getting people to click on things, getting people to watch movies that are recommended to them. Some of these things that AI does really well at. And it's, it'll be exciting to see what things work, what things don't work, but um, we always have to be careful, you know, and, and always have to be humble and always realize like as, as humans, we have these limitations and these biases. And, and so it's good to talk with other people about it, get, read the literature, and, and I'll say it to the students too, you know, because they'll worry, hey, I'm learning Python now. And, you know, Python, Python will be gone one day, just like, you know, maybe IBM or Google will be gone one day, right? Nobody ever thought Bell Labs, would, but, you know, then become something else. But the point is just stay hungry and, and learn about the process and be good to people, build, build networks, you know, get people to like you, um, figure out what you truly enjoy and what, what has meaning for you and what your values are. And, and just be eager to learn and realize like, so you move on and, and Python isn't the important language, but you'll know about functions and you'll know about objects and you'll know about those concepts, right? Just like if you learn Italian or something, you know about nouns and adjectives and verbs. So it's just about how it gets pieced together. It's really about having the curiosity, the humbleness, the drive to, to you know, to kind of put it all together. It's, Thank you. That that was really a good way of uh, working the Zillow in and uh, real estate. <laughs> that is really one of those things where I personally, when I'm doing analysis, I consider it a garbage in, garbage out. If I don't touch and feel every little segment of the market and the neighborhood, I cannot give any advice because you have to know what numbers you're throwing into the pot in order to get what you want out of it. Um, and just one last question, and I know we're kind of like heading to that end now and we're going over it, but what would you consider data saturation? Um, meaning that too many companies have too much data and now the data is not as useful. Well, so it, it kind of depends on the underlying process, I would say. So for example, you have to think of time being, so for example, some things become stale, um, some patterns change. So a lot of companies saw this with COVID. So typically the data, when, when models get trained, they need to, many of the approaches involve collecting um, things that we think are predictors and then the right answer and saying under these settings, you know, the house has, uh, you know, this many square feet, bedrooms, bathrooms, this is the price. Um, and you, you build a training set, you train the model, but then you see that during COVID things are very different because what changed now is people can live wherever they want. All of a sudden it renders that data. I wouldn't say completely meaningless, but we're, it's in a different regime. So, so some of the research I did in grad school is about understanding that in the background is this regime and you have to kind of figure out what regime are you in and based on that regime, pick the right model. Um, so, and, and then there are things where it's just like, you also just want to find holes or gaps in your data. So for example, like when you look at Tesla and the self-driving cars, it's easy to get data on just like flat roads. It's, it, you know, and there's lots of that data. And, and maybe then they start to realize we don't have a lot of training data where the car's driving on a bridge or a tunnel or something. 
So it's, it's really about, so sometimes people ask, how much data do I need? I say, it, it really depends on how many different sorts of patterns there are in the data. Like what are the driving conditions? So it's really understanding how is this model gonna get used uh, and thinking about like time and place and, and the different sorts of patterns. I don't know if that, is that kind of what you meant by that question? Yeah, because yeah. you're absolutely right. Uh, if, of course, the, um, the data saturation, as I was thinking, is when you have you're putting in too many parameters, and now you're not getting the you know what you need to get out of your information. Yeah, but I say also a, a best practice in data science is, is to kind of divide the data in pieces, and um, so you don't want to train on all of your data. Then you have no way to evaluate its performance. So, and the other thing you want to keep in mind is like making sure, so usually you train on, on one piece of data and evaluate on another piece of data, but that other left out piece of data needs to be representative of what you've trained on. So for example, um, I love Bodo's bagels on the, you know, I go to the one on the corner and maybe I'm trying to predict their revenue. And um, so I collect some data over the past, build a model, and it, it's super accurate at predicting their revenue for a given week. All of a sudden next week they change their coffee. And um, you know, that may have implications. <laughs> and, and now that model that I've trained, whether I had you know, 10 weeks of data or you know, 10,000 weeks of data, it may no longer do a good job predicting things in the future. This is a small example, but, but the, the point is you never have enough data if the future looks different from the past. Um, so that, that's the great fear of data science this is that you build this model and then something changes. What do you do? You have to start collecting data from the new process and incorporating that in uh, as quickly as you can. That, that was an excellent uh, way of explaining that because now my understanding is from what you're saying is there is no end to the need of data science or data collecting or because things change every day. Anyway, that was that was really really interesting. Uh, thank you so much. Sorry we went over it's just fascinating no, so far, whole conversation and we. But I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the show Cosmos, Carl Sagan? Should we do a Cosmos for data science? <laughs> Maybe we should. <laughs> Anyway, um, thank you. Somebody, so somebody. Much. Can't, can't wait to do the uh, data palooza tomorrow. You know, now you intrigued all of us. Uh, the link is on the on the side on the chat for anyone that wants to copy it. Uh, we hope to see you tomorrow. And um, Prasha Tashman, thank you so much. Wendell, thank you. We really appreciate you coming tonight to talk to us about data science, you, the school, and how useful all of this is. Uh, thank you everyone for attending and I wish everyone a good night. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thanks for attending everybody.